loud and clear. For those of you who did not hear my name correctly, indeed, my name is Stalin K. Before you make judgments, does not reflect my ideology. It reflects the ideology of my father at the time I was born, and I was too young, only 28 days old, to protest a gruesome name like that. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I love cinema. And do you remember the scenes where a lot of poor people, powerless people, are harassed by the bad guy, and then our dashing young hero comes to rescue them and fight off all the uh, goons, along with his three dozen topories? Exhilarating, isn't it, when you see good beat evil? Here's the thing, though. Even when I was a kid, I identified more with the people standing in the circle, nameless, motionless, dialogueless people who merely watch, never participate. Not that I was not a romantic. I am a romantic. Not that I did not dream of superpowers and flying. I did, and I still do. But I'm more inspired by the birds that fly together in hundreds and never crashing into each other. I don't know how they do that. Do you know that a lot of birds, oops, oh, those are the birds. They never crash into each other. Do you know that a lot of birds that fly in formation take turn to lead the flock? The ones flying behind often comes in the front and then they lead and then they keep turning. They keep taking turns to lead the flock. Well, let's take a look at our own flock, the humans. Let's see how many of us are flying and how many of us are still stuck in the mud. And how many of us are yet to grow wings to fly? Let's take some look at some numbers. As of 2016, 1% of India's population own 58.4% of the country's wealth. Their wealth increased a whopping 10% in the last two years. If you take the top 10% of the country's population, they together collectively own 80.7% of the country's wealth. If you take the bottom 50%, the bottom half of the entire population, they together own less than 2% of the country's wealth. I'm going to give you some more numbers. Now, as you hear these numbers, Please don't allow your prejudices to slot me into a particular type or a brand. Hear me through the rest of the talk. Listen to things that I'm saying. And then, if you must, typecast me. As of in the last 20 years, 54,000 people have died in armed conflicts, mostly in Kashmir and some states where Naxal and Maoist insurgencies are really high. Of these, 26,000 people were termed as terrorists. 85,000 people are security force personnel. And 20,000 civilians died. You can figure out your ratios, your Amdavadis. In 2015, 45,000 cases of crimes were committed against Dalits or scheduled castes. In the same year, more than 34,500 cases of rapes were reported in the country. Shockingly, 95% of these cases, the assailants were a neighbor, a relative, a friend of the victim. In 95% cases. Not my figures, figures from the National Crime Bureaus. In the same year, 4.8 lakh people died of tuberculosis. In the period between 1947, when India got independent, to 2000, 65 million or 6.5 crore Indians were forcibly displaced or evicted from their homes. And this is much more than the total population of Gujarat, my home state. So how did we come to this? 
I believe this has happened because we are afraid. We are afraid to know. We are afraid to discover new realities. We are afraid to stand in someone else's shoes. We are afraid to give up our comfort of denial. Nothing bad is going on. What we need today is to be vulnerable. Vulnerable to other people's achievements and failures. I know vulnerability creates pain. We are taught not to be vulnerable. I'm inviting you to be vulnerable. I know that vulnerability creates pain, but also creates love and creativity. It definitely creates learning. So, if you, let's say that you are one of those who really wants to know, who wants to sympathize, and you really care, you will need to be informed, right? You will need to know stories of what's going on. Now, if you are looking towards the mainstream media as your source of unbiased and relevant information, with headlines like that, I would say that you are courageous and daring. I would even say that you are dexterous in maneuvering split screens and split personalities. How did the media come to this? Now, if you are one among, the do, one, among, one among those who find yourself holding your head between your hands, right? Every time you see something on TV, like, what is going on? There might be some reasons, and some of, one of the reasons can be understood by a survey conducted 10 years back by a Center for Devel uh, Studies of Developing Societies in Delhi. They surveyed, for the first time ever, social profiles of top key decision makers <clears throat> in national mainstream media. And they found that Hindu upper caste men who account for 8% of the general population of the country hold 71% of the positions in key decision making positions of mainstream media. On the other hand, <clears throat> OBC communities that account for 40% of the population hold 4% of these positions. There is not one single tribal or single Dalit decision maker in India's national mainstream media. And they account for 25% of the population. These figures tell you a story of who controls media, and also a story of, therefore, who creates the content and, therefore, what kind of discourses are set in this country. It also tells you that why certain issues get a lot of outrage and certain issues find no outrage. You'll see the bias on, one, on certain kinds of things and a complete ignorance and denial on other sides of things. So, is if you, if you are one of those who think, oh, I don't look at nest, uh, mainstream media, newspaper and television for my information, I have my social media platforms to inform and be informed, bear in mind, you are one amongst the lucky, privileged few to be on the right side of the digital divide in this world. This number of 15% social media access in entire Southeast Asian region is not surprising because our region and Africa are amongst the lowest in internet access. This may increase, but you have to know that you are amongst the top 10. You are among the 80.7% ownership people. So, is there a way out? Is everything dim? Or is there a scope for those who want to be vulnerable? Those of you who say, I want to be informed. I want to take informed positions. What do I do? And I say, yes, there is a way out. And that way is to listen to the stories and opinions of those who live the realities that we spoke about. The reality of everyday violence, discrimination, forcible evictions, the, the, the realities which are different than ours, some are similar to ours. We need to know and understand their stories. Now, my work, besides making documentary films, is to train people from the margins of society to create their own media. 
Seven years back, I, along with 33 other colleagues, started a network called India Unheard. Today, that network is 290 people, which includes 250 uh, community reporters who report from 192 districts spread over 20 states. Over the last seven years, we have produced more than 5,700 videos. If you go to our website, you will see through our reports why corporations get away with large-scale environmental degradation. You will see that untouchability is still rampant in this country and why law enforcement agencies often turn a blind eye to it. You will see You will see why one million people are displaced every year and why some communities are protesting mining and other extractive industries in their areas. You will see how patriarchy teaches us to be sexist and misogynist and how some people are breaking those stereotypes and breaking those power structures. You will see how the state brands protesters as Naxals and Maoists and rob them of their dignity and rights, you will understand why Kashmiris believe that India has occupied their land and why they look at armed forces as the opposite of saviors. You need to understand to empathize. You We, these reports that we do are really eye-opening, but we just don't stop merely at making them and publishing them. We show it back to the communities, we show it to the local government authorities and compel them to take actions to solve it. Every month, we document and publish 110 or 120 video reports, of which about 20 are solved every month. So if you go to the website, you will see more than 1,200 solutions videos where communities have together worked and solved ish long-standing issues of water and sanitation, electricity, pensions, widow pensions, Mandrega scheme not working properly, the list goes on. So it's not just reporting, but also sort of taking the charge to solve things. I believe that those who, those who are exposing the wrongdoings of society, the evils in society, are heroes of democracy. Please don't shoot the messenger. Think twice before you shoot the messenger. Think twice before you brand someone as an anti-national merely because they're exposing wrongdoings. I believe the people who expose the injustices are heroes of democracy and they do so because they believe in a more peaceful, just, fair world. They believe that democracy is far too precious to be left only in the hands of a government or a political party or a bureaucracy or armed forces. Democracy is the business of everyone. No one in a democracy is above the rules of accountability. No one. There are no holy cows in a democracy. I believe that if we are interested in our future, our collective future, we have no choice but to be vigilant. And I therefore invite you to rethink the three wise old monkeys made popular by Mahatma Gandhi. We need to speak, see the evil. We need to report on evil. We need to listen to those who experience evil so that we understand the cause and effect of evil. We need to shout out the evils that goes on and we need to amplify others like myself. You should amplify my voice so that collectively we become the critical mass that is required to make this world a better place. I believe that in the, in, in the in this jest of coming together of our collective future, that we will all not, will not just be mute spectators of democracy, 
but active actors in shaping our democracy and shaping our future. Thank you so much for listening to me.